Long ago, there was a desert village with a well at its center. The houses clustered within the distance, and a jar of water could comfortably be carried. In the cool of the evening, the people came to the well to collect the next day's supply of water, and they lingered there to exchange gossip and conduct business with one another. I often quote this story by the late Bill Mitchell, whose course I was privileged to take in architecture school. He describes how the well, like the fire pit, supplied a scarce and necessary resource, and in so doing also became the social center, the gathering place that held the community together. While the well and the hearth have been replaced by modern networks of water and energy distribution, water still draws people. Water is the lifeblood of the city. In its absence, we have to go out and find it. Through human labor or through engineering prowess, we have to bring it to our cities. But once it has served our needs, it continues on its circuit out to rivers and seas. Global migration increasingly tracks water. People flock toward supplies of fresh water or run from rising sea levels and climate catastrophe. Water provides the common denominator of human decency. The poorest and the richest both need water. Laborers and landowners, tourists, immigrants, politicians, priests, prostitutes, they all drink from the same fountains. In a historic moment in which societies are fortifying their boundaries to ebb the flow of people, water passes regardless. As architects, we know how hard it is to stop water. Rome was born on and of water. The Tiber River unites and divides the city, both. It's possible to graph the rise and fall of Rome's population in parallel with that of water. As we pause in Rome to drink from the public water supply, we partake fully in this decision to provide a basic resource to all, regardless of provenance, social status, race, or religion. In the simple gesture of drinking clean water, we recognize our human commitment to nurturing a healthier, more equitable, and inclusive society. But as we pause to drink, how often do we reflect on this? How many people are drinking with us at any time? Where are they from? What are their stories? In many societies, water brings people together. Think of the laundries of rural Italy, where women, primarily, would work and exchange news. Think of the baths present in so many cultures, including ancient Rome. Think of rites like baptism. When water ceases to flow, its absence brings crisis. In 2017, when Rome's misinformed mayor shut off the water fountains under the erroneous impression that it would save water, everyone suffered. Only a few generations earlier, as De Sica's Ladri di Bicicletta shows, poor Romans on the outskirts of town depended on public fountains for their water supply. On a lighter note, when the Trevi fountain is shut off, in Fellini's Dolce Vita, the magic suddenly dies. Water is a part of Rome's culture. Back in 2019, when Venice Architecture Biennale curator Hashem Sarkis invited my studio to submit a proposal, um, I reflected on the theme how can we live together and wanted to address the possibilities of water in public space, the public qualities of water. In recent years, Rome has reversed its traditional inclusivity and uh, enacted laws which limit the public use of water, the fountains, and other re urban resources in general. Think about the closure of the Spanish steps to people sitting. We were interested in how the city resists this tendency, instead celebrating Rome as an open city and a city of water. This is a question which, according to Sarkis, everyone in every generation asks and answers differently. According to the brief of the Biennale, more recently, rapidly changing social norms, growing political polarization, climate change, and vast global inequalities are making us ask this question more urgently and at different scales than before.
I've been to every architecture biennale since the early 2000s, and I couldn't remember any public drinking fountains there. So we first thought it would be nice to simply provide people a place to stop and drink. To allow a lot of people to drink at once, I made a wall with multiple spigots and bent the wall slightly to give a sense of enclosure. This idea recalls a bit the Aqua Egeria Springs where I occasionally go on the Appian Way to fill up water bottles. Of course, the proposal opened up the question of where to get fresh water and how to eliminate the wastewater. There is a long tradition in Venice of dealing with the water, we know. It's a city built on water. So we figured this could be solved eventually. The important thing was to make it visible, to make the process visible. However the water comes into the site, I wanted to provide a sort of high-tech monitoring panel which would make visible digitally the quantities of water, the pressure of water, the arrival of water, and then as the water leaves the site that it would pass through an exposed channel at the feet of the viewers and then into a space where one could understand its continuity out into the water system of Venice's canals. Since there might be a queue of people lining up to get water, I included this digital display which would inform people waiting about the precious resource that they were waiting to drink, drinking in data as they prepared to drink in water. The idea was to show real-time maps of global water distribution, maybe one showing flows of water to people and another one showing flows of people to or from water, migrations related to water. These could also illustrate the qualities of water, videos illustrating why water draws us, easily shot at Rome's public fountains, which attract people from all over the world. So again, people flowing to water, water flowing. Because of COVID-19, the Biennale didn't happen in 2020. This project wasn't accepted in the end in any case, and this was a great relief since the idea of actually building a working water system in Venice had honestly terrorized me. If all goes as planned, the Biennale will open in May of 2021, a year late. The question that's posed by this Biennale, how will we live together, is as always a timely one but even more so in the, the pandemic, which has struck the world since the original question was posed. Um, it has been reframed, let's say. How will we live together? How will we live apart? How could we be together while being apart? And again, once we reemerge into public space, which of course will happen sooner or later, how will we understand that the very togetherness of humans in public space is one of the things which makes human beings great. I think in this little design experiment, this little design game, um, we were able to discuss the uh, value of water, not just the physical value for our bodies, for our agriculture, for our planet, but the value of water is something which draws us together, puts us on a level playing field where everybody needs the water, the, the wealthiest among us, um, should have no more right to water than the poorest. Um, the water as a basic public right, but also as something to celebrate, also as something which we should glorify, we should recognize the, the greatness of having something so simple and yet so important.